Hi, welcome to Ability Fierce. I'm Michael Asker, and today we have Julia Miele Rodas, the author of Autistic Disturbances, Theorizing Autism Poetics from the DSM to Robinson Crusoe. It's a new book available on Amazon and the University of Michigan Press, and it seeks to look at autistic language in the literary tradition and show us that what some people think is not typical actually has a long tradition and how we can listen to autistic language to better understand what they're saying and better understand ourselves and our culture. Hello, Julia. Hello, Great. Michael. So nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. So you were telling me that this book, it takes, uh, it's sort of like a study of literary, uh, of literature, looking at expressions of, of thinkers and that how this jibes or co co comes together with autistic thinking. Yeah, I actually like to talk about sort of echoes of autistic voices or autistic ways of speaking. Autistic ways of speaking, autistic ways of using language are around us all over, are a, an important part of literary history. And I'm trying to reclaim that contribution to the literature and say, you know, hey, this is a foundational element of the way literature operates. And it's an autistic way of speaking, an autistic way of using language, whether the authors are autistic or not. So you're trying to reframe the, the discussion of autistic expression to, to legitimatize it, is that? Well, I'm saying it's already legitimate, and I'm saying let's notice that. So um, in the clinical literature, people talk about neologism, so the invention of new words. Mm -hmm. And the clinicians tend to see this as, again, a, a kind of diseased or disordered language. You know, you should use the language that everybody else uses. Everything should be standard so that we mm -hmm. can all communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, my favorite example is actually um, from my, I have, I have a baby sister. Mm -hmm. And when she was very young, uh, she was calling a can opener an Oliver because her relationship with the can opener is that it opens a can of olives, which is a very desirable item. Mm -hmm. And I, to me, like I rejoice at this kind of invention. It's so, um, it's so fresh. It gives us um, a new experience of language. It invites us to rethink the way we use language and, uh, what what the clinicians call neologism, what I'm identifying as language invention is, or autistic language invention, is also one of the things that we find most richly in the most productive and revered kind of English literature. I mean, Shakespeare is famously uh, responsible for all kinds of new language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Shakespeare does it, we're going, whoa! Yeah, this is yeah, so awesome. yeah. I think Shakespeare has a lot of license to do that. An autistic person, you know, a, a, a poet, you go, oh, that's brilliant. And then an autistic person in a second grade mm -hmm. class, you're like, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, a lot of, I think, education, um, the, especially in the elementary school, is just getting you to conform with the societal norms. Yeah, I think that that's very true. Yeah. And I think that the society is beginning to learn mm -hmm. that we need to pay attention to diverse ways of being in the world and honor those mm -hmm. ways of being in the world. You know, it's, it's always a negotiation. And I, you know, everybody has to participate in the responsibility for us understanding one another or relating to one another. But, you know, frankly, some people have more responsibility than others. Mm -hmm. and, you know, pe journalists mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, educators have a special responsibility to listen hard mm -hmm. and find the value in the way other people exist in the world. I think. Yeah, I think also police and nurses. I've talked Absolutely. to, you know, but so how does it look if we if we understand the autism poetics, if we grant that this is a different form of expression as opposed to a wrong form of expression. Mm -hmm. How does that look? How would society look if we could all be enlightened by this view? Well, 
first of all, just as a baseline, I'm I'm arguing it's already there. Right? Mm-hmm. The same way disability is always present in our life and everything that we do, and it's a matter of noticing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm suggesting that this these autistic echoes that this um, autistic form of expression is already foundational to our language, right? Everyone neurodivergent or neurotypical or anywhere on that spectrum is actually using language in this way. And it's just that... Well, it may be. Yeah. I'm just trying to see where we get, where mm-hmm. you, when you have a better appreciation of it. I think that we need to make more space for listening mm-hmm. to all kinds of non-standard voices. Mm-hmm. And we part of that is not necessarily trying to figure out what the other person means. Sometimes when people talk, all kinds of people, Mm -hmm. we're expressing ourselves without necessarily wanting to perform a function with our language. And I think that if we're not challenged in other ways, we, we ordinarily have this kind of generosity with one another. You and I are in a conversation right now um, I think we're both sort of high-end users of standard mm-hmm. English language. Mm-hmm. And still, we're going back and forth trying to sort of arrive at some shared understanding. You know, if in everyday life, when we encounter autistic people who might speak in a more profoundly atypical way, mm-hmm. we... We listen hard, right? Don't don't interrupt. Don't try to um, put words in the other person's mouth. Is this what you mean? Is this what you want? Um, be patient, uh, as you would be for somebody who is coming to English from a foreign language, for instance, uh, as with somebody who is a stutterer, for instance. Wait for the person to say their thing. Mm-hmm. And it is often by waiting and listening and paying attention that the other person is able to to negotiate um, their own expression in a in a way that better serves the other person you know I also grew up in a disability culture household Mm -hmm. so I was kind of you know kind of an insider in a way, you know, to disability culture growing up. And I, you know, always felt perfectly comfortable, you know, pretty much always felt perfectly comfortable with blind people because I have a blind person in my family and I grew up that way. Mm-hmm. Now, this um, is your sister. Uh, my my brother. Your brother, younger or older? Uh, a younger brother. Younger brother. Okay. Um, and, you know, just for the record, he now has a big fancy job at Amazon and a PhD and a nice family and all that. I always like to add that. So he was in. able to take it and get and make something with it and yeah, I mean, uh, with adaptive equipment, I assume. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of which he built himself and mm-hmm. the experience of, um, you know, having to invent things out of disability also became, you know, who he is intellectually and enables him to contribute, you know, to lots of different people, not not only people with disabilities, you know, through his his use of or not just his use of technology, but his development of technology projects. Right. So the obstacle became sort of like a, a grain of sand in the oyster that that made the pearl. So it's a right. it's a happy yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. Um you know so, so having grown up in this disability household, you know, also, you know, in the in the seventies, in the eighties, before we were, you know, became members of a a larger disability political community. Before, you know, I discovered uh, disability studies and sort of devoted myself to that work intellectually. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really understand the larger politics of it. I was also just a kid. And in our house, of course, you know, we did this kind of disability hierarchy thing. You know, our our disability was is not even anything because it's just the way we live our lives. Mm -hmm. But other people's disabilities were, you know, maybe not terrifying, but, you know, definitely, you know, definitely foreign. Okay. Well, I could see that we can learn to listen to this. Mm -hmm. But what do we learn when we listen to it? I think that we learn to reconsider 
mainstream values. And that means politically, it means culturally. Um, and, you know, as a, as a professor of literature, even it, literarily too, mm -hmm. that, that we, there is always a benefit to defamiliarizing what we think we already know. Mm -hmm. Autistic voices, um, by defamiliarizing language, by defamiliarizing social expectations, uh, invite us mm -hmm. to reconsider the ways that we interact with one another. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, oh, it's not polite to talk about sex or body parts. You know, why, why, why not? Like, what's wrong with talking about vaginas? Like, mm -hmm. that's not a dirty word. It's not a dirty thing. Uh, you know, and I'm not necessarily saying either that, you know... Well, there's a, there's a be... level of hypocrisy in mm -hmm. ordinary discourse. We yeah. deny all, a lot of stuff, and then when people bring it to the forefront, even though it's true, people are just, well, you just yeah. don't... Yeah. I, yeah. There, there's a lot of... And there's codes that we're learning that tell us how to behave and keep us in line. Yeah. So, so, of course, being autistic, you're going to disrupt that because you don't fit into the codes. I was at a meeting, and a woman from Zambia got up and said, they brought their daughter here and found out she was autistic. Mm -hmm. That in Zambia, there's, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So it, there's another way of understanding it in that culture. It may not be a better way. I don't yeah. really understand it, but it was interesting that she had to come to America to have her daughter classified in a sense. And she was very happy and she was very positive, which was surprising to me that she was getting services for her autistic mm -hmm. daughter and able to treat it and that in Zambia, this wouldn't have been. But again, the, I find that often there are cultural constructs that may be more uh, autism friendly or something mm -hmm. that allow a place in society for that kind of behavior. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I mean, there, there are autistic ways of being in the world mm -hmm. um, that, you know, sort of get brought into relief uh, mm -hmm. against you know, one cultural backdrop or another. I think that for, uh, for autistic people, um, there are ways of being that, um, you know, kind of fit seamlessly into some cultures. Mm -hmm. And it, it winds up being that autism itself is just, you know, another way of being. It's not particularly noticeable. But for, you know, in, in some cultures, Autistic ways of being are, are going to feel very disruptive. Mm. You know, disability has a very different cultural presence in different global cultures, uh, sometimes in a way that's terrible, where, you know, anybody, for instance, with a mobility impairment is just kind of Exposed. shut away. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, or, you know, otherwise kind of cast out from the culture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in ways that are beautiful and delightful, where you'll you'll have um, neurodivergent people, you know, people with psychiatric disabilities, for instance, yeah. uh, regarded as especially spiritually valuable and insightful. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I realize that could have a downside also. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, disability and autism in particular winds up being different things in different cultures. So you had a blind brother, and how did you get into interested in autism? Um, I, I was working on my PhD in English literature. Uh, I wanted to write about disability, but I was you know having a difficult time finding mechanisms mechanisms for mm -hmm. doing this because the culture in general has you know two ways of looking at disability and you know by culture I mean sort of text, you know, mm -hmm. movies and and stories about disability mm -hmm. generally come down in one way or another. You know, stereotyping disability. Is Rain Man. Uh, maybe. I mean, disability in general, you know, <laughs> is either this pathetic right. thing, you know, or, or in Rain Man, it's, you know, it's an opportunity for growth. Right. You know, or it's evil. You know, mm -hmm. this villainous right. thing. Right. There, that's and, unfortunate, you know, but it's And I wanted yeah. to be writing about um, this particular poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, which is a, a blind, uh, a poem about a blind kid. Um, I wanted to be writing about that in a more interesting and complex way. That's what literary scholars do. And my brother said to me, yeah, you know, there's, 
this thing called disability studies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I made contact with some of the people who were working in the field and I, I did some reading and that was, you know, a love affair that started probably 20 years ago. And I just, I got so excited about writing about disability and the, the liveliness of the field for exploring all of this culture that, you know, it destabilized all of these ways of, of experiencing uh, culture. And from there, you know, hanging out with people who do disability scholarship, many of whom are disabled, mm -hmm. uh, it started to be that my disability world was not just a blind guy and maybe some of his blind pals, mm -hmm. but you know, a whole range of disabled people. And I started to recognize disability as its own culture. And, you know, from there, I, I read and was writing about disability in various permutations. And when I, when I found, um, when I found autism, it just really resonated for me. You know, I, I don't consider myself to be autistic, mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of autistic values and experiences and especially autistic uses of language really resonate for me personally. You know, I, I am often able to contain my outbursts and my interruptions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, this is partly also overlapping with Jewish culture, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and New York East Coast culture, which is a culture of, um, abundant expression of talking over of interrupting of active listening um but it's also from this very personal love of language you know i i don't necessarily um perform this in my everyday life i'm able to restrain myself mm -hmm. but you know i do have this love of words this, as a tasty thing you know i will repeat words to myself Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, so when I was reading about autism, I, I felt identified, even though I, I am probably not autistic myself. <laughs> okay, you so always have to. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be appropriating anybody else. Right, autistic. right. It's, it's, it's very interesting to see who, because usually people come to these things like people, like my interest in cerebral palsy is due to my son's cerebral mm -hmm, palsy. Right. If he didn't have cerebral palsy, I'd be a lot less interested in cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that you had, uh, and I also, my mother was blind and deaf. Ah. Um, but I didn't really think of it as a dis. I mean, clearly it was a disability, mm -hmm. but it, it was just the function, the way we function. Right. Yeah. Um, and then when my son was disabled, well, I realized he was disabled. Um, I didn't even connect the two things really well, except that I thought that like lightning shouldn't strike the same place twice, <laughs> yeah. but it does. It, uh -huh. it, there's no guarantee uh, that you're, and I think that's the impressive thing about the disability community is mm -hmm. there's no uh, no one's exempt. So you you're plunged yeah. into a community of tremendous diversity. Yeah, it happens to poor people, it happens to rich people, mm -hmm. it happens to Indian people, it happens to Chinese people, it happens yeah. everyone. Yeah. So it, it, it is a rich experience in a way, yeah. but it's also um, because of just so many of the realities and how society is stacked against mm -hmm. those with disabilities. It's also a, it can be very depressing and uh, uh, destructive. <sighs> yeah. yeah. So, but that's interesting. Um, so basically, you, so this is an attempt to explain that this is just, that autism is just another type of expression. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a celebration mm -hmm. of, you know, this way of using language. Um, and ha have autistic people reached out to you? Yes, absolutely. The, the preface is, or the forward, rather, is uh -huh. actually written by an autistic person who is also a, um, a rhetorician. She's a, a, also an English scholar. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I worked with, you know, so a lot of the, the autism theorists, autistic theorists, I... I cite in the book are also people I collaborated with on other academic projects or other intellectual work. So, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth and I've gotten an extremely positive response, uh, especially from people in the autism community. Although, you know, I don't want to portray that either as a monolithic mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. you know, there are people who, you know, p 
people in the autism community who regard autism as a tragedy and wish that it didn't exist mm -hmm. and wish they weren't autistic. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't really feel privileged to have an opinion about an autistic person feeling about their own autism. Right. I'm just curious about the response yeah. that you've gotten that people have appreciated it. it, it it's, it's, been, so, yeah. it's been largely very positive. And has this been on a level of insight or on a level of, of at least it, you're, it, it's kind of you're giving them uh, an academic sort of cover. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't mean to say cover in the sense that there's something, but you're saying it's like, okay, well, look, this is, I may sound strange, but look at the back, it's grounded in something now. Yeah, or Yeah, I mean, I I think, yeah, exactly. It, it becomes a, a theoretical or academic foundation mm -hmm. that, um, that justifies the mm -hmm. celebration of autistic ways of being in the world and particularly autistic ways of using language. But... Um, it also, and I, I did want to talk about this sort of in, in larger terms of disability studies, that it is also a way of democratizing um, this celebration of disability. So, you know, often the academic disability studies is kind of regarded as this separate thing from disability activism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I really feel deeply committed to breaking down that perceived difference. Um, I, I, That's interesting. Yeah. You know, how? Well, I think that even though this book is, you know, absolutely an academic book, it's mm. intended for an academic audience, it's, you know, for use in college classrooms, for use in research, the ideas that are here are democratic ideas. You know, listen to people who might not sound, you know, who might not use language in ways that you expect. Mm -hmm. And also recognize the fact that disability is always there. And you know, in this particular case, autism is always there. I'm not necessarily saying Andy Warhol is autistic, although he may have been, or mm -hmm. Gertrude Stein is autistic, mm -hmm. although she may have been. Mm -hmm. The thing is that this cultural at artifact, these texts exist um, with a kind of debt to autistic ways of using language. And so autism is there always present in our cultural history. We owe something to it. Autism exists in art, not just representations of autistic people, but autistic ways of making cultural artifacts. So disability culture, books, mm -hmm. art, mm -hmm. uh, video, uh, digital products, you know, video games, clothing, you know, all of this stuff which we share, which is not relegated to something that's regarded as the ivory tower, mm -hmm. um, is is already a part of our world. Mm -hmm. And um, I I consider it to be a kind of activist gesture mm -hmm. to say, recognize this stuff, mm -hmm. value it for what it is, value it for its disability inflection, um, and at the same time, require disability in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Not just the presence of a disabled person, mm -hmm. but the presence of disability in the curriculum. So in addition to doing my scholarly work mm -hmm. and doing my teaching, mm -hmm. um, I also work on projects that are uh, disability forward projects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ways of recognizing and um, paying attention to and building disability culture. Mm -hmm. So one of the projects I'm working on right now is with people at the Metropolitan Museum of Art mm -hmm. called Crip the Met. Oh, right. I saw that. That's Yeah. Nice. And it's this, you know, I'm just, I wanted to share mm -hmm. a little bit about it because it's mm -hmm. so exciting. So the Metropolitan Museum has a long and terrific history of including people with disabilities in the museum, right? There are all of these access programs. They want to make sure that, you know, people with all kinds of disabilities have access to the collections, can get into the museum, can interact with the art. They have touch programs. And this goes back, you know, like a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're always building those programs to be more inclusive. But now they're 
thinking about disability studies as another tool of inclusion. Mm -hmm. So not just sort of making sure that people with disabilities can get into the museum and mm -hmm. have access to the collections, but also making sure that everyone who visits the museum recognizing that disability exists in the collections. Mm -hmm. um, and they've brought together uh, people from inside the museums, uh, administrative staff, curators, and outside disability scholars for this, um, this series of sort of mini conferences to talk about how disability exists in the Met collections and the importance of seeing disability when you walk in the galleries, not just seeing other visitors. You mean placing it in an art historical context? Exactly. And what, what are a few examples of that? I mean, I think of Christina's World, which is a, right. a very obvious one, but I can't think of many other. So sometimes it's just disability representation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, artifacts that show disabled people. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a talk at the Met the other day called Making Disability Visible, and one of the items featured on the poster is this sculpture of Nydia, the blind flower girl mm -hmm. who is escaping Pompeii and helping sighted companions because she's making use of hearing. So there are lots and lots of representations of blind people, for instance, in the collections. But even beyond representation, uh, there are lots of artists who have disabilities mm -hmm. or who through the course of their artistic life became disabled mm -hmm. and continued to produce art. Beethoven became deaf. In the same way Beethoven became deaf. Mm -hmm. You know, we have artists like, you know, Chuck Close, for instance, mm -hmm. just as the low hanging fruit. Uh, you know, so there is this contribution from disabled artists. And then beyond that level to sort of get into the weeds with the disability study stuff, there is also art that reflects a disability aesthetic. Mm -hmm. The same way we have autism poetics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is this visible range of art mm -hmm. that suggests disability. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a guy named Tobin Siebers, a disability theorist, who talks about this quite extensively. Um, but it's, it's very exciting that this is happening in a real public space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while the Met has had all of these internal conversations, it's now beginning to set up programming that is intended for the public that will elaborate on this idea of the presence of disability in the collections. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to share that as one of no, the, that's, these that's, important overlaps yeah. between academic and you know, academic disability studies, disability activism, and disability culture. Right. No, that's that's amazing. And I think the fact that they're calling it Crip the Met, it, it, it takes on a... I, I, I think we've come to the point where a lot of, in the past, it was always like inspirational and nice yeah. stuff. And being a little in your face is is, yeah. is, a, is a welcome change. Yeah. It's a, a little bit abrasive, uh, like aftershave on your... <laughs> So, uh, Feel the tingle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. All right, well, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.